All right, what a way to start. We've got two hyenas here at the moment just uh, sniffing around. And uh, I don't know what they've picked up on, but there's two of the hyenas that's just come down. What a way to start our sunrise safari. And I'm hoping that we are going to get maybe some more action, maybe some cats around here. Apparently, a lions were chasing a buffalo around on a dam cam last night. Good morning, everybody. My name is Cedric, and behind the camera with me on us, we've got a panda. So thanks so much for joining us on our sunrise safari. And uh, so let's see which individuals we've got here. Looks like Mbilu. Is it Mbilu? One of the hyenas? Good morning. I don't think so. No, it's not. Thought it was. Good morning. Look, maybe in Ngangarika. Very, very likely. Another one here, yeah, much younger. Another younger one following suit. I'm going to get my head out the way here. Yeah? Very interesting, nice. Oh, sniffing something. Hopefully, it's not my shoes. <laughs> but yes, joining us on our sunrise uh, safari, you've got uh, Steve and Muscles and Paul and Wendy, and down in Amakala, we've got Eric and Morgan. Our team up in uh, Johannesburg is Jared, Chulu, and John, and then Max is our tech. Okay, let's go. This is live, this is interactive, so if you've got any comments and questions that you want to send through to us, please do so. And if you're watching on the Wild Earth app or the website, make sure that you do register. Alright, uh, I'm going to let them go that side because they came from an area here. As I said, I am following up on a lions chasing buffalo last night, same as Steve. Steve and Steve's in, uh, just to the east of us and I'm doing the western side here and going north towards uh, Biffles uh, cut line, so the northern boundaries of uh, Juma. So, I haven't seen a single line track at the moment. I'm gonna let those hyenas go through because I think Steve might be that side, so I might bump into him. I'm gonna continue with my mission to see if we can follow up exactly where these hyenas have come from. But let's just take a look. You never know what's uh, happened around here in the, this block. Tina, yes, very nice having our characters joining us this morning, very nice. What a way to start uh, our sunrise safari with uh, two of the hyenas. But let's go take a look. I'm just going to go a little bit further up. We might bump into more there. There is, I can see in the distance, there's a battalier here as well. So, yeah, and we also had hyenas calling this morning. So maybe in this block, and this block is very, very big and very thick. So, let's see what we can pick up on. Mm. I'm looking forward to this morning's drive. I think it is some, something is lurking somewhere. Yeah, oh, so it's in Gwazi, so Gangarika was the one in front and then Gwazi at the back. So, nice, very, very nice. <coughs> Ngwazi, that's... That second one there was, uh, of course, Ribbon's previous, previous cub. And, uh, and Gwazi was the one that was bitten on the head by the black dam males last, I think it was last year, beginning of last year, if I'm not mistaken. But recovered very quickly. Recovered very, very quickly. All right, so let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. Uh, come on, come on, come on. Lions, you can imagine lions on a on a buffalo kill right now would be a, a wonderful, wonderful addition to this morning's sunrise safari. All right, while we're going to continue searching around here, let's go and take a look at the weather at locations this morning. Good morning, good morning everybody. Welcome, welcome. Have a look at 
this. This is, I think, the sunrise that we've been looking for and the sunrise we've been waiting for. This is amazing, wow. Not now, not too often that we get sunrise like this. The clouds and the haziness, everything is just perfect, perfect, perfect. Unbelievable. And this is the perfect. The perfect start to the morning. My, this is stunning. This really is stunning. Hello, hello everybody. My name is Eric, joined by Morgan behind the camera. And this morning we are going to be your eyes and ears. As we've already showed you our beautiful sunrise. And hopefully we can show you some more beautiful animals. Morgan's just going to switch to ND cards. Oh, look at that. Wow. We. This is what I was talking about last night. When the clouds really aid the beauty in the sunrise or the sunset. And they really do. Yes, indeed, indeed. And we're now moving into the new month. What a fantastic way indeed to start the month of March. And it's just getting better and better and brighter and brighter. I thought the clouds were going to be a problem, but it looks like there are no clouds on the horizon. But just above the horizon, that's where they are. Goodness gracious, it's warm already. And generally, when it's warm like this, it'll be warm in the middle of the day, but not type of warm that we're talking about now. We're talking about hot. If you are a driven nature enthusiast with a background in communications, then this message is for you. Wild Earth is calling for volunteers to moderate our web and social media chat platforms during our live broadcasts. Do you keep up with the latest trends on social media? Do you have quick fingers and a sharp eye? Then we're looking for you. To apply, email your CV to us at jobs at wildearth.tv. Join the Wild Earth team today. Wild Earth, connecting with nature.
think it's appeared from one of the clouds. Have a look at that. Oh, Kaylee Morgan's really doing the work this morning. This is unbelievable. She's become a lot brighter now. I will apologize as there will be some noise in the background. The reserve is doing some form of procedure with the use of a helicopter. So we're not too sure how long that's going to go on for today, but there will be a noise. Well, it looks like we've located on uh, the Cape Buffalo, uh, just north of the boundary um, in another property. So we're just kind of getting, getting a view from the boundary road, but it looks like most of them are very relaxed, you know, some of them lying down. Ooh. You can hear hyenas going crazy, fighting on something, but just further e uh, west from where we are, northwest in Biffleshook, so... I'm hoping that we are going to get lucky with maybe something along this uh, boundary road. But let me uh, you can see well, you can see that buffalo looking up there. Exactly, that's where the sound came from. With our hyenas are busy fighting over something. Right, um, uh, I want to stay with the buffalo again now, but there's, you know, there's something telling me that I want to go further west. I think, find uh, it. Let's go west. Yeah, I, I rather want to try and follow up on uh, these cats. Just want to take a look around this side. Yeah, and it sounds like the hyenas are going crazy this side. You know, the typical where they start fighting over over a carcass or something. Let's go take a look. I've got a feeling it might just be inside Bifflesook. That's a property that's just to the right of me. And we do not have traversing in there, so... <coughs> Leopard lover, oh yes. Uh, we have found lions due to a carcass, oh yes. Uh, uh, that's happened not once, that's happened many a time. So I think uh, a carcass that's there for like a day, day and a half, a buffalo that one or two lions are busy feeding on, not knowing that there is lions on it, and we picked up on the scent of it, scent of the, the carcass, and then went in on foot to go and investigate and found lions busy feeding on that. So yes, that has happened a few times. Uh, they're going slowly, yeah. So maybe inside, yeah. I don't see anything on the, oh, there's a hyena, yeah. There's one hyena here at the moment. Uh, one of the youngsters here. And you can see this one's also just listening out to where that commotion was happening. sense of hearing and smell.
still get in. Fortunately, there is something happening deep inside here, not too far up, not too far north. We won't have view of it, but uh, there is definitely some uh, hyenas that's fighting over something that side. So, all right, well, we're going to continue a little bit. I'm going to go slowly along here now. I just keep my eyes peeled, just to see. Hopefully something does come down for us. So. Interesting. You can see that hyena that went to po uh, across there, heard the, all the commotion and started calling as well. Like, I'm coming! I'm coming! Alright Jared, I'm just going to stop out and listen for a little bit this side, so yeah, I just want to see. I just need to try and start working things out here. So yeah, I'm just letting Jared know that I'm not going to move much more now, just for the next 5-6 minutes. It's very difficult to tell exactly what they were chasing around there or f fighting over, but uh, it wasn't something small. Maybe, maybe those lions that I was told said that was chasing the buffalo, very possible. Maybe they made a kill in there and hyenas are pushing their luck there. now. I have another thing that's come to me and looks up and I'm going to get a chance to sit to you for too long, yeah? Alright. Fortunately, sometimes you have to have a little bit of patience to find predators and uh, get that opportunity to try and see and work out what's going to be the best way to locate them. So 50, yes something was uh, definitely was stirring inside there for sure. So we'll come back here again just now. Uh, I'm just going to give it a little bit of a chance and then we'll come back again. This is going to go a little bit further up uh, west on this boundary road, on the northern boundary. I had male leopard tracks as well coming into this direction, but uh, it looks like that male leopard might have turned south. 
Oh, it might have. Uh, I don't see anything further here. I'm just going to do a little. I'm just going to do a little bit of a loop around and work this area, but I still haven't seen a single lion track. I don't know where the lions came in, and phew, I haven't seen a single lion track. It's in a leopard track, and hyena, and the hyenas, but uh, no lions. Alright, so well, we're going to continue trying to follow up on uh, all this uh, chaos that's happening around here. Let's head over to Steve as he wants to say good morning to everybody. Good morning, good morning and the happy 1st of March everybody. Happy Friday. Welcome here to Buffleswick Dam where Cedric has been searching for buffalo tracks and so have we. We also didn't see any lion tracks but my name is Steve. I'm joined by Paul and his daughter on camera and welcome aboard the Sunrise Safari here. On Juma Private Game Reserve where we've tracked another herd of buffalo towards Buffleswick Dam but um, they haven't come through yet so I'm going to go down the road. They've come back onto Juma though. I'm going to go down the road and check Nyala Road north and then maybe Hyena Road, see where they've gotten to. Lots of action it sounds like last night. We didn't hear anything. And the perpetual cat and mouse between buffalo and lion. Thing we'll do if we do find lions hunting buffalo like two vehicles in for broadcasting give different perspectives different angles it's not an easy thing to do just on your own Cedric and I were super excited for that this morning we charged out early at least he's found the buffalo though Some prides of lion, as we know, are very good buffalo hunters, and others are not so much. So which lions they potentially were, I cannot say. But our hippos, they don't really care too much about that story, do they, Paul? Yeah. No, they don't. Oh, how time flies when you're having fun. Daylight saving time for the US and Europe has arrived. The 10th of March will see the US shift an hour forward. And the 31st of March will see Europe and the UK also shift an hour forward. Stay connected to nature from wherever you are in the world. Go to our website to find out more. Don't miss a moment with Wild Earth.
think that was the first it, well, it was the first time me seeing them properly away from the Burma. The first time there obviously was they just come out the Burma lured with a uh, a carcass and uh, that was it was a nice sighting but it's not not the ideal sighting because it still looked like they were in the Burma with the fence around it. Hmm. Now we're obviously not alone looking for these three amigos. There'll be some others from the from the the lodges close by. Hmm. Looking for these boys. So we may hear some noises of some cars or even see some cars. Now, these boys can walk. I mean, they can do some distance in the night time. It's actually scary how far they can move. But, I mean, they didn't look like they wanted to go anywhere yesterday. But we cannot rule that out. It's always, it's always like that. As soon as you say something, something else happens. If you say like hmm the elephants are gonna come all the way and drink some water by us today hmm, right, so when the elephant when you say the elephants are coming to drink some water down at the lodge it never happens murphy's law they go straight past the lodge they were going in the direction it looked like they were doing it they don't do it um like say for instance, if you think oh, the male cheetahs, hmm, they're going to be gone at some stage. They'll be there in the morning. Or if you think that they're going to stay here for the evening, and they actually end up leaving in leaving that specific spot, it becomes fairly, fairly annoying. So if you're just having a, a quick scan in this area, and you really do have to look thoroughly baby jackal yes maybe not as many times with birds and other animals but I've definitely relocated them with their calls um, uh, there was one situation where they were very very close to uh, the lodge that, we were, that I was working at um, and uh, we just heard the snip Yep, yep, and this was before all the guests had got onto the vehicle, and all the guides, <laughs> all the guides looked at each other, and we all knew exactly what that was. And we hadn't seen them on our way to the lodge, so we were very excited. Almost like first come, first serve. Got to get out as soon as possible. So we were all rushing our guests <laughs> to get on the car so that we could quickly go and find these boys, and we did. They were not very far away. We really do have to look thoroughly for these boys. I mean, those who were watching or who tuned in last night or yesterday afternoon saw they managed to find them. They were lying fat and it was very, very hard to see them. We are going to send you over to Cedric as we to help him with his search party. Thank you, Eric. Nice that you got those amigos for the morning. Uh, okay, my search at the moment, uh, not much happening down this road. I might go a little bit further south. As I said, there was male leopard tracks coming towards where those buffaloes were. It looks like they might have cut a little bit uh, south into the block. So I'm just going to maybe look towards uh, the big open clearing here at our camp. Just want to have a bit of a scratch around here. Um, unfortunately, we don't have any view of those hyenas and the buffaloes have moved in a little bit further. So uh, no much more visual than that. 
but we'll try again there just now. I think uh, we're just going to first uh, just do a little bit of a scratch around this side. Mm. So 50, so many feline mysteries at the, in the works at the moment. I fully agree. I think, I, as I say, I haven't seen any, uh, I can say, any clips or anything from the lions chasing buffalo last night. I was just told. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult to say. And so Steve and myself, uh, we both worked that, uh, that little area there in, uh, around the dam and we haven't seen, we didn't see a single thing. It's all buffalo tracks, yes, and that's about that. Right, let's just go towards open clearing at the one that's just south of our camp. I just want to quickly double check around this side. Oh, the sun is nice and sharp this morning. Very, very sharp. Feline Mysteries, yes, from Feline Friday. Come on, come on, come on, kitty cats. <laughs> Pangolins galore, you say you think you might like the sound of hyenas more than a lion's well yeah it is fantastic i love it i think we all we all enjoy that noise it's quite uh quite exciting noise especially when they are busy going at each other and uh and you know and it's got all different noise apparently hyenas have got 12 different calls 12 different calls so uh, it's amazing it's each it's a call for each kind of situation. Oh, okay, well, we've got a lot of impalas that's just uh, really kind of relaxing up here. <clears throat> Let's watch them for a little bit and listen out. It's always good just to stop and listen out. Good morning, good morning, good morning, ladies, and one or two gentlemen here. All right, well, we're going to just listen out a little bit this side. Let's head over to Steve to see if he has come right with any tracks. Thanks, Cedric, and welcome back to us, everybody. We haven't found where those buffalo came out, but so we had a Franklin alarm calling just before, and we stopped, and we saw a Dacre moving away from the Franklin, and the Franklin was like, oh, how embarrassing. I was alarm calling because of a Dacre. I've seen it before. I've seen uh, animals alarm call with Steenbok and Daker because they're small and they're like sort of sneaking through the grass. They sort of have that resemblance of a leopard. Quite comical though. That was a very embarrassed Franklin there standing on top of its termite mound. <laughs> Not really. How can you tell if a bird is embarrassed? I can't really tell. So Gwen, our director, wherever you are today, your day off, happy birthday, Gwen. Gwen Vera, happy, happy Earth Day, 1st of March. Can you believe it? Okay, so this road's called Hyena Road. This goes straight to the north where we had a buffalo coming in. We thought maybe they went through to the dam, but um, nothing fresh at the dam. Debbie, well, this kind of weather really, it's starting to warm up already, so it's just another day, another day. There's no wind, there's no cloud cover, so it's, it's the best the predator has to offer versus the best the prey animal has to offer. So uh, the cover of darkness is where the predators do well. So after a full moon, you know, the full moon starts rising later and later and later, just under an hour later each day, about 53 minutes. 
So that hour of darkness and then the next hour of darkness and then another two and three hours, that's when it starts becoming more beneficial for predators in the dark to hunt. But in the early daytime, unless they stealthy and catch animals around water points, uh, it's a tricky time. But vegetation has still been quite dense. There's still quite a bit of thick grass cover. So that helps the, the predators for sure. You were with us with Tlalamba the other day and uh, she was moving and then she just lay down. It's just invisible. Absolutely invisible. There's an impala standing here. Hello. Hello. I see you shining in the sunshine. Anna Marie, some early luck, thank you very much. Hello, Roy. Really? I think it might be my car making a funny noise there as the car stops and the fuel moves around. Just listening. Heard something strange behind us, but I think it was just my car. Well, the elephant herd we had last night at Bivelswick Dam, they went, they went west, so this would have been the road that they crossed, but that was many hours ago. We know elephants don't really bed down or stop anywhere for too long. The pilots here are also quite relaxed. looking for some signs of those boofs. If we don't find them on this road then they've cut through or they're in here. Victor, they say monkeys have got a number of different calls that they have but I've only really heard monkeys do the one typical call. Um, Kuru, Nyala, Mpala, the, the call is all quite individual um, and I've never noticed them doing anything different. Squirrels have got the normal when they see anything that's on the ground that's dangerous and that could be a snake to a mongoose to a leopard but then when they see a bird of prey it's this high whistle so when you hear that you know a squirrel see the bird of prey go outside and you'll see that bird of prey fly past. Um, other than that, I haven't noticed any other animals have a different alarm call. I'm sure there must be slight variations, but I haven't been able to detect it. I haven't been able to detect it. Okay, well, we're just going to head along here and see if we can find of these buffaloes. Did you know that the only group of birds that can fly backwards are hummingbirds? We are celebrating World Wildlife Appreciation Day with a tell-all. Send Cedric and Steve questions about any wildlife species of your choosing in this Wildlife Ask Me Anything. Learn amazing new facts and brush up on your knowledge about all things wild. Become an explorer and watch it live on the app. Wild Earth, connecting with nature.
gonna do Mvubu Road, this one road going up here one more time. One more time. Let's, let's see, we might get lucky with something. So sometimes you just have that feeling on doing something. Uh, that feeling is to do that right. Kayla, what what is one sighting that I really want that I haven't seen yet at a Juma? I know it sounds maybe bad, but it's always something that I'm really like kind of like it's it's quite it's it's hectic, but it's interesting. Is uh, leopards fighting? So maybe a male, male, maybe like a tortoise pan and Mulwati. I know, as I say, it's bad. It's not like we want to really see it, but it's very interesting. It's very interesting to see it happen. Uh, I've seen it only in my entire seven, eight, 17, 18 years being in the bush. I've only seen it happen twice. And it's intense, but uh, it's very interesting just to see which one is more dominant. You know, Then you can really get to see who who's the fighter and who's not the fighter. So... Now, I think uh, that sighting would be amazing in, in, in certain ways, yeah, in certain ways. As long as there's no fatalities, that's the main thing. As long as there's no fatalities, I'm happy. And they must like shake on it and then they can go their separate ways. But it is always interesting to see that. I saw it happened uh, happen with a, a leopard called Tyson and uh, Mafufunyan, two leopards that used to be in this area many years ago. Huge fight, <coughs> fight between the two of them there at a dam called Big Dam. So that happening that side, intense. It was quite an intense fight. And then I saw it with a leopard called Raven's Court and Euphorbia male in the western sector. We apologize for the loss of the feed to Juma. But you are here with us live at Amakala and we are looking for animals here. It's a beautiful morning. It's starting to get very warm now. I think I may need to rethink this whole jacket thing. <laughs> um, but for the time being, it is a great start to the morning. We are looking for some lovely animals. Now it's been quiet so far. We went up to the place where we last saw our three amigos and they have definitely vacated the area. It is clear. There's not a single soul. Well, not that we could see. It's very possible they could be there. Mm, and if they are there, they were in the bushes. But um, we are looking in other areas for them and you can sometimes also tell where you know if a predator has moved off because you normally see <clears throat> predator well not predators you normally see prey sticking to specific areas or specific animals will stick in specific areas like black wildebeest you normally find in the same sort of area as they tend to graze on the same grass most of the time Zebra you can find within also the same area. So if you find animals not in places where they're supposed to be, well then you can ask the question, okay, well what happened here? Why are these guys here and not where they used to be, normally are? You know? Is there a specific reason for that? And that can sometimes help you finding some animals. Kuma, you and me both, I'd also love an elephant walk by. But uh, I believe our elephants, well actually, 
Where were they? Oh, they were sort of not far from that little path that we saw them at, sort of underneath the, at the foot of the basin, the, the bottom of the mountains there. But where they were was a bit of a no signal area. And I don't think we would have been able to have broadcasted this. So it's not, not happy at all. We're waiting for them to come back up the side, and I, and I, I suspect they will. If they're there and it gets hot today, they're going to need to come up for some water. And they need to find a, a big enough place so they can swim at. And those water holes are in front of Bukela and Trossi Lodge, which is on this side of the basin. So they'll have to come up. They're wanting to swim. Huh. Okay, we found some animals. We've got a herd of blessed buck and uh, some black wildebeest. I don't know if you'll see the blessed The blessed buck are doing their own thing. They're running in circles. And some warthogs. They go off some hardy dogs, probing for their earthworms. Why are you running? They're running away from us. I'm not too sure why. And we're driving very slowly. We're not even creating dust or making a lot of noise. Joanne, it varies. It really does vary. Um, at the moment, <clears throat> I'd say the center of the reserve is the best place, really, um, because they that's where most of the water is at the moment for the animals. Um, but when there's lots of water all over the place, generally where all the prey animal, prey species, that's generally where you will find uh, majority of our sightings. Uh, but now that we're not scarce on water, there's just some pans that don't have as much water anymore. So animals are forced to sort of move and bounce between the two. So there's a decent amount of water holes towards the center, but in the basin side, but then there's also big water holes towards our dune forest side. So it's, it's a bit of a mixture, a bit of a mixture, but I would say more or less the center of the reserve and not sort of the outskirts anymore. Even maybe there'll be some giraffe in this area as well. Say again. How the animals in Amakala are habituated. So the animals that we have here are all wild animals. And we want them to all stay as wild as possible. We want to have no, we don't want to help them in any way. So a lot of them, they come from places where they are habituated with cars and people, but don't rely on the people in order to, uh, 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 you know, to stay alive in a sense. So our lions, they are self-sustaining, our cheetahs are self-sustaining, um, and these are all animals that have or obviously come into contact with people but don't rely on the people and that's because we want this to be a rewilded area obviously it was all farmland before at one stage and now no longer farmland now area the, we want it to be back well as, as natural as it was so also a lot of the time a lot of the animals that 
that we have here are animals that would have naturally occurred here before it was farmland or before it was used for farming. Most of those animals, except for uh, giraffe and impala, they're not normally from here. On safari. Now remember, this is live and interactive, so we'd love to hear from you. To be having these incredible experiences in this wild underwater forest. It, it was just one of those things which I don't think I'll ever see again in my life. Thanks for joining us on our sunrise safari. Such a lovely track and sign that everybody, if you look closely in that track, you'll actually see the hairs, the t tiny little lines along the drag. Those are the hairs on the end of the elephant's trunk. And he's walking towards us and he was walking while having a poo. You can see that by the evidence of the distance between each of the droppings, dropping from his bottom as he steps no time to waste when you're looking for the ladies and then he drags that trunk on the ground as he steps his gait is moving left and right which causes the gait and the trunk to move in that sort of zigzag like fashion and then he'll pick it up to his mouth and smell where are they okay they're this direction and he'll keep following so a lovely bit of track and sign there on this early morning here on this Friday morning here in Juma where like Eric the Sun is starting to warm up as we gear up for what is said to be a rather warm weekend Okay, so let's carry on down Cheetah Cut Line here. Even the elephant is going north. It is what it is.
Baby Jackal, I don't know. They both got hair. Um, who's got more hair? I couldn't say. But they got these very sharp, spiky hairs on the body that you don't really see. And there's little hairs on the trunk, which is evidence in, in the track. But I don't know who's hairy. It's pretty sparsely haired. But you wouldn't notice. And it's obviously over time before when hair was probably a thing with the mammoths to keep them warm. I don't have, don't have too much hair. You really have to look quite closely to spot it. You can see it in the ears. You can see it on the trunk, little spines. And uh, if you ever happen to touch an elephant, it's all over the body. But these very sharp, spiky hairs. I've been involved in a couple of elephant dartings where they uh, put collars on. And they got to, to sort of get up close and personal with a few elephant bulls. That was absolutely magical experience. NJ, well the tusk, the tusks aren't necessarily there to rest the trunk. You can imagine how much weight the trunk puts onto the head. When they do put it on the tusk, it actually adds weight. So they just stand there and they put the trunk on the ground. They just extend those muscles down and it just rests flat on the ground. We see it regularly uh, when they are resting. Um, but the trunk is also not often still it's often busy and it's lifting and moving and it's a constant process with the trunk but uh, when an elephant does fully lie down their trunk is finally at peace but it's one of those extensions on the body that are constantly weighing an elephant down but they don't have much of a neck so it's not really causing too much in the ways of pulling otherwise it would lead to some neck difficulties the length of the, their nose extended with the, the height of the body and the strength of the neck. They were once upon a time probably a more agile animal, much smaller with the ability to feed with their, like almost like a duck duck, a bit of an extended nose. They would physically feed with the mouth. And slowly, over a very long time, it got longer and longer and longer as the elephant got bigger and its face got further away from the ground. Okay, well Cedric was following up on male leopard tracks. Let's go see if his gut feeling provided him with any luck. Yes, look at this black-headed oriole. Isn't that beautiful? We hardly ever get to see a black-headed or put it on screen because it's so difficult. But it's got a worm. And it's like eating a caterpillar, a little hairy caterpillar from one of the trees. It looks like a caterpillar. That is nice. A black-headed oriole. Beautiful black, black head. Beautiful, nice, striking orange beak. A yellow body. That's a nice red eye. Looks like it's very happy with its uh, meal for the morning. What is it doing now? Is it like just cleaning its beak, or it looks like it's just cleaning its beak. Yeah. Had a nice little breakfast there. I got those be that beautiful call that. There we go. It's just gone onto the other little branch here. Oh, see the. You can still see the yellow front. You'll see when he goes. It, it pops around there. Look at 
can hear the other, the other one calling behind us somewhere. The most common birds we see, well, I'm sure it's a sparrow. Like a grey-headed sparrow. Uh, laughing doves, turtle doves. So doves and sparrows. <clears throat> I'll say that'll be the most common birds that we do see around here. It was very, very considerate actually <laughs> sitting there in a little bit of an open clear spot there for us for a short period. Now he's gone into the thickets here of this marula tree, into the canopy. Still got that nice air panda. Well, straight after our sun arrives, a safari is uh, live at the waterhole. is going to have a new look from today. Two new waterhole shows in partnership with Africam. The first show is going to be Sights and Sounds of Africam, and that is from 9 a.m. That's directly after our sunrise safari to 11 a.m. Central African time. And our second show today, live at the waterhole. Will be from 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. Central African time. Please make sure that you do tune in for that. It's going to be marvelous. It's going a little bit further into the thick stuff there. Huh? Still got it. Erin, yeah, well, black-headed oriole, it is. That's a, we get to hear them quite often. We see them, but flying off, yeah, it's so, so difficult getting them on screen. And uh, Panda is doing a brilliant job just keeping up with uh, this black-headed oriole while it's pretty much fluttering here in the canopy of this marula tree. I love the Orioles. No, it's gone too deep now, eh? A little bit too deep. So I haven't I haven't seen the African golden oriole or the Eurasian golden oriole. I haven't seen those two. I've just seen the black headed oriole. So the African golden oriole and the Eurasian golden oriole, both of them they don't have that black head. They've just got completely a gold goldish body where the Eurasian has got a more of a little bit of a blacker color on the wings but I would love to see them but I've never seen them before so that is one of the birds that I would love to find here at Juma and we, find, we do get them but very very uncommon all right let's move on uh, Panda I think that was that was marvelous that was fantastic seeing that bye 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 <clears throat> Alright, so we had a lot of hyenas calling further south into Juma now. Uh, well, we stopped not too long ago. And uh, it sounded like towards maybe Galago Pan. Uh, there's a little sneaky two track that goes up the drainage line there as well. So I'm going to go and take a look there quickly just to see. Sounds like a lot of, a lot of hyena activity around this side. Out in the wild, life moves fast. To capture the action, you've got to be in the right spot at the wrong time. Now, incredible animal behavior, selected from amazing amateur and professional footage to reveal the secret lives of animals in motion. This is raw nature caught in the act.
Now, quite often <clears throat> you'll find these guys here, especially these two. I've noticed that there's always been two bulls in this area, and I've noticed they're scattered around as well. Well, not they scattered, they're droppings. Um, it would appear that this would be the territory of these two boys. Now, fairly odd is you normally have one male who holds a territory, not two. Interesting. And now, now they they leave their poo all over the road for us to drive over, and that's how they get their territory to be marked. They get they get us to do it for them. They also make these little dust beds where they will often lie and roll around in the dust and they will also defecate in those dust little bowls uh, and roll, roll around in that. And then go and find a nice tree where they'll go and rub up against it. Rub up against this bush. Lie down over here. Basically they're carrying the smell of poo wherever they go. They're facing away from the sun. Definitely very warm. Well, not very, very warm, but uh, <laughs> I don't think we're keeping up with how quickly the, the, the atmosphere is warming up at the moment. It's very, very warm. A flick of the, of the tail to chase all the unwanted flies away. Jared, yes, I am still wearing a jacket. I'm still wearing two, actually. We just went through a very cold area, so I thought, now I'll keep my jacket on. Now that we've come up to the top of this lovely hill, <laughs> the heat has changed on us. Oh, these guys are calm. Very, very relaxed. The one in the front has actually got his head completely down. No, Jake, they are actually, I mean, I think there's about four different species of black wildebeest, sorry, of wildebeest. We have only one here. There's the black wildebeest, there's the blue wildebeest, there's the bearded wildebeest. There's the... <clears throat> They're evading me. There's two others. The... The Martin... It'll come to me. But the ones off, off the top of my head... Yes, the golden. Thank you, Jared. The golden. And I believe there's the... Oh, there should be one other. So that would make it five different species. Now you can't put them together. That's why we only have black wildebeest. There'll be other places where they will have blue wildebeest and they're slightly bigger. But you can't put black wildebeest and blue wildebeest together because they actually end up fighting and it becomes quite fatal. These guys fight very roughly. Hmm. Where are your females, guys? You've been here alone an awful long time. Oh, a little yawn. Definitely still trying to wake up. That one in the in the front there, his head is down completely. There's the one at the back. He does look like he's looking around every now and then. Assessing their areas. I see the one in the front is definitely the younger one. As the horns are smaller. Not as thick at the base. Whereas the one at the back, oh they're massive.
Uh, the bugs are back again to bother me. No, you know, not very many people actually like the black wildebeest. They say they they're fairly ugly, but they're not. They are incredible. I mean, the horns are magnificent, as you say. Um, they're just a bit, I wouldn't say funny looking. They just don't have the conventional head shape, horn shape that most antelope have. They are unique. You don't want to be hit by those horns. Oh, no, 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 no. Not that uh, black wildebeest are prone to attack people. They're not. But any animal, if startled, if given a fright in close quarters, is dangerous. Especially wild animals. Wild animals are huge compared to us. I mean, they really are. Most antelope weigh the weight of a person, of the average person, if not more. There's only a handful of antelope that will weigh lighter than us. The springbok, the dacre, some impala, uh, bushbuck, inyala, pretty much the same size as us and heavier. Right, let's send us, send you, not send us, let's send you up to Duma to check in with Steve. Thanks, Eric. Well, we've arrived, everybody, at our white crest helmet trike nest. And it's the first time I've come here that it's been unoccupied. Now, then they say it's really unoccupied. Anyone more volunteers? So there's a group of them. That will be out and about foraging. Maybe the eggs have hatched and that's why they're all away to go and provide food. So we're going to sit right here. Until they come back. some bull snapping when they come back. Excitement. France wants to know if something's a problem on board. Did you hear what he said was a problem? No, snakes, a problem. snakes, most certainly France. Uh, the Boomslang is probably one of the most predatory, egg predatory and baby bird predatory snakes around. Pythons as well are very arboreal. But definitely a boom slung. They are good at getting into the nests of all sorts of birds, including the weavers. But um, a group of these helmet trikes, if the one individual was staying here on the nest, which they normally are, or close by, if there was issue with a the snake, there would be a proper, proper inquiry, a proper uh, mob attack on that snake, and not only would the whole group get involved, but so would every other bird in hearing range would get involved. We often hear birds alarming. <coughs> 
like that and we can actually use that sort of sound to attract birds because they think that there is an alarm happening there's something dangerous nearby the birds come out on mass to come and help and support other smaller birds in identifying and possibly mobbing and chasing away owls mongooses snakes But it's very well concealed, that nest there. But as with all nests, they do run the risk of predation from genets, snakes. Tim, it's very neat, isn't it? Wound together with cobweb. It takes about four days to build. Made with uh, strips of inner bark from trees. And that's bound and plastered with a web of spiders. It's then lined with smaller pieces of bark, rootlets, grass, lichen. How long will they be away for is the question. If they have, they do come back and there are chicks, we will hear raucousness, raucous noise as the adults perch above and then provide sustenance to the chicks that will just be begging. Don't forget everybody, this is a live and interactive safari. Our questions or comments are valuable to us. Send them through and get them answered in real time time that's right real time it is 22 minutes past seven on the first of march 2024 so send you through your questions relevant to what's going on on the screen we'll often get them answered not always not guaranteed but questions pertinent to what is being spoken about will often get fed through in this segment or potentially the next and your name will appear on screen. Okay, well I've got my, my book and I've got my coffee and we are going to wait this out. It's been a few days since I've been back here. Yeah? can't remember how many, two maybe, three. There's no way that they've hatched and fledged in that time. Looking at a almost three week incubation period. I was hoping that they would hatch during my time and we'd get to see a little bit of activity. Freedom is irreversible. We raise our hands and we say, We will be free! Great mass of South Africans deny that humanity.
they compile of these small family groups that I've never seen more than 10 in the family group. If there's more than 10, that's a fairly decent sized herd. The average is probably about five to six members. There will be one male, and maybe about four to five females, and maybe another young male. And that's how they operate. Because they mountain zebra, they would have inhabited the mountain side of 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 locations. Now, you you can't have a full herd. You can't have over twenty members all roaming the mountainside. That gets dangerous. It gets overcrowded. You know, if they want to sit on a ledge, you know, not all of them will be able to stand on that ledge. It's it just it it becomes too much. So they tend to stick to these small family groups, where as your plains, zebra is the one that has the big herds and the large herds. Your gravies as well. They also tend to congregate in fairly large herds of members. Well, it's not a leopard, but at least it's a lilac-breasted roller. As you can see, it's sitting right on top of the dead tree, and a beautiful light hitting it. So the light is behind us, and uh, it's just a stunning, stunning light. Then they really look pretty if you get the right angle. And uh, don't fly, do not fly. No, stay. And you see that stunning purple lilac color on the cheeks and on the breast area. Beautiful blue in the center between the two wings. On the back end there, and a green, green head. Beautiful colors on it. Apparently they've got around about eight different colors on the entire body. What a makeup, huh? Eight colors. All of this sits perched up in this uh, dead tree, just waiting for an opportunity. So if it sees maybe a little insect or something flying past or on the ground like a grasshopper, you'll find that this lily posted rider will quickly go down and try and grab that insect. So all other roller species are migrants except this one. This is only my uh, roller species that does not migrate. It will be here throughout the year. Even on leap day. <laughs> no, Stacy, I don't think, no, we don't see big flocks. Lilac breasted rollers are more kind of. Uh, and then pairs around the area, but you won't see, they're not like the European roller, I mean, European bee eaters and the swallows. And uh, yeah, those ones will be all in those big flocks. Um, the starlings, I think, are the wattled starlings, and that's, uh, but you'll find that your rollers pretty much always see them by themselves. Or you might see a pair of the other, I can say, the other individual close by. A scratch for the morning. And I think if you come to the Greater Kruger Park, I won't be surprised if you leave the Greater Kruger Park after your visit that you will have one or two or three or ten or twenty photos of a lilac breasted roller because they're all such beautiful colors plus they're always perched on top of like a dead stump or on top of a bush always in the open so they really expose themselves to those photog uh, photographs to those amazing pictures So 
Just keeping an eye out. And how does it get its name? A roller? Well, all the roller species, they'll actually fly up and then they kind of do this tumble, like this roll down, like in a display. So they'll kind of roll from side to side. They do this beautiful display. All right, well, we are going to slowly head towards tree house dam. Let's head over to Steve as he's also doing some uh, birding. And let's go see if he's found that uh, shrike with the little babies or the eggs. I'm not too sure. Thanks, Sidders. Well, I could hear the family calling, bull snapping, and doing the typical sort of noise north of us yet. I thought they were returning but I haven't heard them again. <clears throat> so I was just doing some reading about the breeding success and uh, pairs without helpers are generally not successful so it's definitely a species we see as a cooperative breeder. Groups of more than two birds have great success. So if a fledgling of young or the nest is lost, a new nest is started anywhere from a week to a month and a half later. And in general, there's about a 30% in the studies of successful brooding. It works out to be about 118 fledged from 464 eggs. The main cause of egg loss and nest loss is predation specifically from reptiles, so monitor lizards, snakes, mammals, the list would probably include the genet birds, including the Batalia, African Harrier Hawk, Gabar Goshawk. So when you look at 30% success, it's pretty low. I don't know what's happened at this nest, but we will stay for quite some time and see if they come back. Carol, not 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 100%. Some birds will selectively choose certain types of tree, but that's just because of the type of tree. I don't think they're saying, oh, this is a marula, I'm going to choose the marula. It's some trees, for example, knobthorns, are favoured by uh, large breeding raptors, purely because of the, the height of them, the fact that they're very inaccessible compared to other trees. But then you see vultures nesting in other trees as well, so they don't only pick knobthorns, although the decline in knobthorns is definitely influencing the breeding of large birds of prey. Um, cavities are created in, in a numerous amount of different tree species and that's all got to do with how those trees are damaged and infected and attacked by insects which then lead to cavities being created by woodpeckers and barbets. So it's a suitability of the actual site which makes a big difference. You know, buffalo weavers will, will selectively choose pretty large trees but then they'll also choose power lines or towers of sorts. So it's all about location and suitability. Um, many of our smaller birds will choose very thorny, uh, very impenetrable bushes like the buffalo thorn or torchwood if it's small enough to build their nest inside. Waxbills, sunbirds. So it's not necessarily the tree species but the design and shape of the tree where it occurs is there cover 
Is there access to water? Is there enough food in the area? But I don't think like butterflies or caterpillars. I mean, there's a very specific larval food that the adult lays the eggs on and then those caterpillars will hatch and then feed on that specific tree as the first sort of host tree. I don't think birds are that specific. Although you might find them choosing a similar tree year after year just because of the way it grows, the height from the ground and any other sort of common features that the birds are looking for. At a tree house a dam, one of the dams. It's, uh, it's close to the southern boundary of Juma. And we've got uh, once again we've got El Hippopotamus, a young male hippopotamus that's just uh, resting here in the water. He's been here for the last three days. That's wonderful. I oh, said so he keeps on coming back to this dam. But slowly but surely these dams are going to start uh, drying up. Once they start drying up, then yo, we had a funny smell that just came through. Here. I hope find out. Almost like something, like a, a strong gas, a gassy smell. But of course, with a like a predator. And which way is the wind blowing? From here, eh? from there. I don't think it's a hippo. I don't think it's a hippo smell that. Uh, Oh, it wasn't me. <laughs> Panda's looking at me strange. <laughs> it wasn't me. <laughs> but yo, I also picked up on that. Eh? Something on that side, eh? Interesting.
And then the hippo's like, yep. It wasn't me. But you see his tracks, if you drive around this area, you always see his tracks up and down here, around some of the roads here. Herman, yes, can imagine on a good old grunt by the zipper. <laughs> Something like that. Oh, he's getting a little bit active now. I think because we are here. I'll make sure I didn't drive over some leopard or lion scat. I don't smell it now. Do you still smell it? No, I don't smell it now. Hmm. I might just go up that road. Just getting towards thinking about the, the wind direction. Maybe, maybe there might be something around here. Well, uh, T, look, if it is raining and it's cold and it's windy, sometimes things, sometimes animals tend to take a little bit more cover than uh, when it's a nice sunny, hot day. And you come to these, some of these dams, I think like today, I think this afternoon is going to be fantastic. It seems like it's going to warm up quite a bit. And then, uh, yeah, you come to these dams on a hot day and yeah, sometimes you're lucky. You get the hippos, I mean, buffaloes and elephants maybe coming down. Impalas busy roaming around on the outskirts, busy feeding and coming for a drink. So yes, I find that uh, warmer, sunnier days uh, dams is a little bit or way more active compared to a very cold, rainy, windy day. Well, there is activity at the moment. We just got to find it. That's the thing. There's a lot of activity this morning around the areas, but yo. Oh. Take a look at this. I thought I saw something. Put there, I saw something in uh, old Tlalumba's uh, famous wattle tree, but there's nothing that side. Sanji, um, hippo numbers is not, uh, look, there's, I think there's still 100%. I don't think there's uh, a problem with the, the numbers due to the drought. Uh, you know, some of the rivers, big rivers, there's plenty. I was down in the south, the Crocodile River. And there's plenty of hippos outside in that river. There's definitely not a shortage of them. <laughs> so, yeah, no, no, numbers are still doing very well. I don't think they've got too much of an issue. Yes, I know drought can be quite a big problem, but you'll find that there's a lot of dams and that that's been pumped uh, full of water by with boreholes and all that. You must remember, we, the entire Greater Kruger Park, we, as humans, put a fence around the entire Greater Kruger Park, but a big fence. You're looking at about two and a half thousand kilometer fence. And because of that, we really prevented animals going to natural water holes, natural dams, you know, migrating to where there's rain. Uh, because of that, we had to, of course, make uh, man-made uh, man water holes and, uh, and pump it full of water just for the animals to still have that water around. So yes, you know, you've got that kind of thing. That's the only time that we really interfered due to the fence itself. Because without that fence, you can imagine these animals are all gone. These animals will be in, in the cities and they'll be roaming in the, uh, the rural areas and that's not going to be a good thing at all. So the fence was very important. And it is the largest fence reserve in Africa. So 
uh, with two and a half thousand kilometer fence it's big but we had to make man-made water holes for animals and there's just a lot of rivers Willy Funch River, Letaba this is uh, the there's a lot of rivers that uh, that still pretty much flows through through the entire year, the Crocodile River and all that. And I mean, hippos all tend to find their ways to those water holes or to those rivers. on safari. Now remember, this is live and interactive, so we'd love to hear from you. To be having these incredible experiences in this wild underwater forest. It, it was just one of those things which I don't think I'll ever see again in my life. Thanks for joining us on our sunrise safari. So look at how intricately woven that web is around. Some people say that the, uh, they use that white crest on the top of their head to actually catch and collect the spider web. Um, I don't know how. I mean, I suppose the way we drive through these places, we get spiders' webs crossing the road and then we get them in the face all the time. So maybe that is what happens. Very, very hard to say. But uh, we've been sitting here patiently after this segment. We'll probably bid this nest adieu for today. Tina, you reckon it's a very surprised looking bird? <laughs> I suppose you could say they look surprised. But I um, don't know if they're coming back. It is a bit in the season, probably a last brood that they tried to have. And we don't know if they've been successful or what's happened, but we've been here long enough to assume that they're not coming back to the nest today.
So we've got a another group of Cape Mountain Zebra. We're just not winning with our Mountain Zebra this morning. They keep moving away. Very skittish. Anyway, we're here with another group. They're a little bit further away. We're not too close to them. So hopefully this time they stick around. And there's a lot of talk around the stripes of zebra and what their function is. Most of the time it's for uh, camouflage. I promise you, you look, if you have to look at a zebra that's more than 200, 300 meters away on a mountain, you are not going to see it at all. Especially these mountain zebra. They blend in very, very well. Um, the the second thing is it helps regulate their temperatures so they say that the white stripes reflect a lot of the light uh, when it's very warm and the black stripes actually absorb some of the heat in the mornings when they when they're really cold and they're trying to warm up now that to me makes a lot of sense if you touch a zebra you'll feel that the black stripes will be hot and the white stripes won't be as hot. It also causes them those convection swirls to their, their own breeze. Now there must be a fair, a fair amount of a, dis, uh, a difference between the Cape Mountain Zebra and the the Plains zebra in terms of the heat and their stripes because obviously the stripes are much closer together with the mountain zebra so they have almost less white stripes. N nearer we do keep the mountain zebra and the plains zebra separate from each other to avoid crossbreeding exactly that but also they fight. So it's the same situation with the black wildebeest and the blue wildebeest where they just do not get along well together. I mean, for those of you who've seen zebra fighting, it's not a pretty thing. Them biting each other and the kicking and, oh, oh, no. So we would try and avoid that. And the Cape Mountain zebra is a species of zebra that was on the brink of extinction due to the over hunting of them because their coats are so pretty but now their numbers have bounced back and uh, they are slowly but surely thriving Terence, it is possible, I'm sure, I'm pretty sure that they can, if they mate together, I'm pretty sure it would be successful. Then we could have a pretty interesting looking foal, but um, I haven't seen any reports. I must maybe do some digging and some finding. I'm actually now pretty interested to see. If there's any reports of Cape Mountain Zebra and Plain Zebra. I'm sure they did once before. Before that they were discovered to be a separate species from the Plains Zebra. See these guys, they moved away from us but they don't want to move too far. Because they still want to be able to keep tabs <laughs> on us to make sure that we're not going to cause any problems. Catherine, indeed, it really, it really is brutal. They, they, yo. Oh, I mean, I think the most brutal thing is when a male takes over the harem and there's foals that are not his. 
you know that's brutal because then he tries to eliminate them in any means or ways possible i've seen it before where stalins have just oh, they've gone and they've just kicked and kicked and kicked and kicked and kicked and bitten and bitten and dragged and bitten and dragged these poor foals all over the place naturally the foals obviously they don't make it and that's exactly what he wants because he wants the moms to start ovulating so that he can mate with them because most females out here when they are lactating there's no possible way that they're going to ovulate. So, you eliminate the reason for them lactating, and that is obviously the baby. Ovulation can take place, and you can mate with the female in the hopes that your genes get passed on. seem very relaxed now. Kind of, and they're very similar to elephants where they will always rest like a leg. Where it's, the, it's normally the back leg. They juggle between the two, whether it's left leg or right leg, but one of them will always be resting when they are relaxed. Right, we're going to send you up to Cedric, who's on the move. All right, I'm just sorry, we're just trying to track here quickly. Just seeing now and again, we're seeing a, a female leopard track coming up and down. side. Alright, I'm just going to let this other vehicle come past us. So I yeah, actually wanted to do a bit of tracking here quickly, but it seems like I'm not going to get that chance. Morning, morning, morning. Hi Elvis. Good morning folks. Alright, we just uh, let them go by. All right, nothing on your side now, Pant. Yeah, uh, we were supposed to do a little bit of footwork there, but uh, yeah, we're not getting that opportunity. All right, well, let's move on. I think maybe she might have gone south, because it seems like most of her, her tracks was on the south, uh, southern side of the road going into Hoffman's. Uh, the onion. Diving motor. Uh, the onion. So I'm just trying to get hold of the other guy now, just to try and figure out uh, where's his last tracks, because he, he called me in about these leopard tracks. Hmm. Going all the way to that side, so I wonder if it's not for Lunga, maybe Lunga, Lunga or Shadulu, one of the two females. What's on your side there? Nothing, eh? Right. Oh, I need to go back, I don't even know where she's turned, fortunately. As I said, we'll have to jump off and do a little bit of footwork that side, but uh, I think it's now. We are past that area, and well, maybe we're lucky. Maybe we're lucky and we bump into. Uh... Now they're coming up this side. Okay, let's move on. Oh well, oh well, oh well. All right, well, we're going to try and get that opportunity to quickly jump off and do a bit of footwork here. Let's head over to Steve. 
Thanks, setters. Well, we moved on from our, our nest. No joy. We just found a few more nests over here. I thought I'd just stop while we on the topic of nests. And uh, on the right hand side over here, it's a very typical nest of the red headed weaver. They're made with a, a different kind of material to the other weavers. You often find them in little colonies that the red headed weaver will build one and then attract the female and then build another. Like almost like a, an apartment block. And here they have chosen this large black monkey thorn. Many times through the eaves of buildings, thatch roofs. So it's a typical weaver shape, but uh, constructive of very thin and pliable twigs, vines, and leaf petioles. Gives it quite a shaggy sort of appearance. And uh, nests placed on the outer branches of the tree. Telephone wires underneath eaves of thatch buildings. And they are a brood parasite to the Daedrix cuckoo, the red headed weaver. As with most weavers, the nest is built by the male. But interestingly, is the female sometimes help. Sometimes also some immature males might help. Sometimes a juvenile has been known to accompany the pair during the initial stages, but doesn't help. So there's a rough, strong retort shaped, made of twigs. Sometimes thorny. Marge, they make you think of Africa, these nests. Hmm. The weaver. So when gathering the nest material, they'll often strip the midrib of a leaf, all of the leaflets off, and tug the twigs until they break off. So using very pliable twigs to knot them together and as with most weavers they begin with a, a circle or a ring followed by the nest chamber Not as not quite as neat, Anna Marie, for sure, for sure. I mean, that's because um, they're using actual twigs of leaves, leaf twigs and stalks, rather than than long grass. Um, I mean, you make a nice mat, a nice reed mat. Grass makes such a nice sort of flat surface and makes a nice bowl. The red-headed weaver, a little bit more messy, but yet still serves the purpose. A wide variety of tree species used. Just a two week incubation period. Yeah, in South Africa, October, November, December. So, well and truly on their way already. Out in the wild, 
Life moves fast. To capture the action, you've got to be in the right spot at the wrong time. Now, incredible animal behavior selected from amazing amateur and professional footage to reveal the secret lives of animals in motion. This is raw nature caught in the act. Now on a hot day like this, it's a beautiful plant. If you do not, if you do not at this point of time, I think this and this one is such a stunning color. It's known as a morning glory. Mm, yes, beautiful morning glory. Look at this. Hey, isn't that stunning? It's beautiful purple color just to attract certain insects something like maybe your blister beetles getting attracted by this coming there for a little bit of the nectar inside and uh, aren't they beautiful now if you dig about 15 to 30 centimeters below ground from where this goes in where the stem goes in then you get to a little bulb underneath and that stores a lot of water lots of water and so it's a nice thing if you lost in the bush and you need water to look for this dig that out and once you dig it out you can actually just cut it up a little bit if you've got a knife or you've got like a stick just poke it through and then squeeze it like a lemon and squeeze the water into like into your mouth and uh, a nice way to get some water here in the bush the morning glory beautiful So here we have a valley and in this valley there is an awful lot of life. It doesn't look like it but there is. There will be a host of different birds that make their nests and homes and perching spots there. There will be a variety of reptiles, snakes and lizards. There will be small mammals, more your field mice, and then of course there will be the bigger mammals as well. You cannot forget about the insects, probably more insects than anything else down there. This is the type of thicket that you generally find kudu, 
water back, push back, and nyola. It's also the area where animals will flock to. On hot days like this, being nice and cool in the bottom there. Tina, it took me about two months or so to know the road names, all of the roads. Because if you think about it, Amakala, all of these roads, they're like, it's like a city where there's suburbs, there's road names, and then, and uh, with all of them having different names, it is quite difficult and it is a tedious job trying to get to know all of them. I mean, still to this day, there are a few roads that I'll have to think long and hard. What is the name of this road? But most of them. I know. It's knowing the road names I think is fairly important, but it's actually knowing the area more. So knowing which road is going to take you in this direction and which road is going to take you there. Because you don't want to be taking roads, say for instance, you're in a hurry to get to a sighting or you're in a hurry to get back to the lodge and you take a road that's taking you in the opposite direction, but you didn't know that that road went that way. That could be problematic. For the large majority, I know where I am at all times and how to get out. Somebody green bull down there. With the some netty keys. Uh, no, not stuck. Um, not on the reserve. Definitely on a fishing trip uh, to the Trans Sky, where we had a battery fail on us, but uh, no, we eventually came right. But no, I've never been stranded or stuck out in the bush. I always somehow managed to find a way to get myself unstuck or out of whatever situation it was that I was in. But there's always a first. Oh, it's so peaceful and still here. It really is lovely. It's always nice to spend time in an area just sitting, listening and also reflecting. I don't think we've had too bad of a drive this morning. We may not have found the animals that we wanted to find, but we still found animals. And that's, that's to be expected when you come out here. You're not guaranteed to see the animals every single day. Elaine, the Kruger is where you want to be going. I'm pretty sure that is where the biggest bulls come from. And they have special names, they call them Tuskers. Oh, those are big bulls. And uh, it's believed that's where Collie's genes come from, the Kruger. That's why he's so big. With his thick, thick tusks. The Nediki making a lot of noise up to our right hand side.
we're going to continue down this little road. We're going to send you over to Steve, who's on the move as well. Good luck manifesting your elephants, Eric. We've turned into a little bit of a birding nesting morning now. And uh, it's a big knobthorn tree growing in the drainage line. The nice canopy. I'm in the canopy. I haven't seen anybody on this one of late. But we used to find a batelier pair on that nest there. Not very clear. Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me. So, bataliers breed in the summer months when it's very hot. So, having that huge canopy of tree above enables them to breed now rather than being right on top of the tree where a lot of the other birds of prey will choose to breed. And it's referred to as a platform nest. All birds of prey build what we call a platform nest. It's basically a platform of dry sticks that are just accumulated there, not as intricately woven as weavers nests. And uh, once the sticks are all in place, they then line them with green leaves. Nests are frequently reused year after year. And a bachelor nest generally placed in the first fork of a large leafy tree. Often the largest in the vicinity. You see, so it's not specifically talking about a type of tree or a tree species, but a tree that's got those characteristics. Nice and big, leafy, a big enough fork to, to house the nest itself. And uh, big enough that that first fork is anywhere from 12 to 15 meters above ground. Sometimes even as high as 26. The one nest we see there on uh, Ingwa Alley is very high, very, very high placed nest. And they will choose trees such as the knobthorn, the sycamore fig, jackalberry. They have been known to take over the nest of Wahlberg's eagles. And uh, well, Wahlberg's eagles, everybody also breed this time of year, and they use very similar characteristics for the building of their nests because of the time of year. Hannah, the only predatory bird I can think of that nests on the ground is the grass owl, um, physically on the ground. But um, you do get the spotted eagle owls here that will either nest in cavities in very large trees or on the, the ground in river banks. Um, we actually had their nests on the ground just there on the bank of the river a couple of years. And uh, so, yeah, it's, it's a very strange way to breed, isn't it? Like for an owl right there on the ground. Um, I can't think of any other bird that would do so any other bird of prey. But if you do have nests on the ground, you've got to be very protective parent. And owls are very protective parents. But that is the nest there, everybody, of the battleur. And uh, they lay their eggs in northeast South Africa generally between January and March, so the hottest time of the year. And that's a close to two month incubation period. If you are a driven nature enthusiast with a background in communications, 
then this message is for you. Wild Earth is calling for volunteers to moderate our web and social media chat platforms during our live broadcast. Do you keep up with the latest trends on social media? Do you have quick fingers and a sharp eye? Then we're looking for you. To apply, email your CV to us at jobs at wildearth.tv. Join the Wild Earth team today. Wild Earth, connecting with nature. We're going to see what's happening up here at this dam. Oh, the day is now turning very, very hot. Perfect. Lovely. I think this is going to be a good thing for this afternoon's drive. Some of the dams are going to be busy with the wildlife. All right, so I got a message now. So, all right, so the message was sent through saying we did not see the lions chasing the buffalo. We just saw the buffalo running through the water with lions, with audio of lions. Okay, so that is uh, what we got, and uh, yes, look, that makes it. It's quite a, a huge difference in. Seeing the lions and the buffalo on dam cam and just seeing the buffalo and just hearing the lions and lion, Lions you can actually hear from quite far off. So I think those lions might have been calling around inside Biffleshook So that's where those hyenas were so whooping around. So yeah Anyway, let's head over to uh, Eric in Amakala We're bumbling along fairly bumpy ish road having left that nice valley now in search of other animals it's starting to get very 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 warm so most animals are actually going to start moving away from open fields to more shaded areas as well as trying to find some water water is going to be a key thing to survival Especially on a day like today, where it's possibly going to get up to 40 degrees Celsius. That is warm, just like yesterday. Another scorching day. We had an amazing sunset. 
yesterday so I think we may have the repeat of yesterday hopefully maybe no clouds cross fingers cross fingers no clouds but for now we are just a bumbling hoping to come across some something something anything any animals want to show themselves now please be my guest Uh, the highest safety concern that we face um, at the moment, heat stroke, uh, for the most part it's just being safe if driver. There's a lot of dangerous road ledges where you can go off the road where it's, it's very to actually tip a car. Um, so it's just kind of knowing knowing your vehicle knowing your your skills in a sense and possibly maybe opting if you if you're a little bit nervous possibly maybe opting to not go down a specific steep road when it gets wet it the whole reserve turns to haywire that's when it becomes really really difficult all right we will send you over to Cedric Thank you, Eric. Yes, more heat exhaustion. Uh, heat exhaustion is a, a little bit of a, a thing, and it's uh, always making sure that uh, you've got uh, rehydrates and you're know, hydrated very well, and uh, got your cap, and and sunscreen. Yeah, sunscreen. Some people sunscreen. I can also feel the uh, morning heating up here quite a bit. All right, so I'm heading slowly back e east towards uh, where we had those lions, oh, lions, hyenas calling this morning. Uh, we're going to take a look if anything has come south that side, as well as where those buffaloes are. Let's go and take a look. Let's follow up. Yuri, no, I don't think I've seen an animal sunburn. I think just with the hippos. Hippos, if they're exposed to the sun for too long, uh, they, of course, they, they start uh, uh, drying up. Their skin starts drying up quite a bit and it starts breaking and cracking and all that, and it could end up uh, fatal for them. So they need to stay close to water on very hot days. So hippos more so than anything else. So more so. I'm not too sure if anything else will get sunburned. I'm sure there might be. I mean, there's certainly like elephants and buffaloes and that will always take their body full of mud to protect their skins. So the like protection for something. Uh, nothing coming over here. Nothing, 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 nothing. Well, don't forget this afternoon on our Sun Asset Safari. Of course, the on-show highlight show will start at 3 o'clock. That'll start at 3. And our sunset safari this afternoon is at 3.30. So everything is a half an hour earlier. As well as the kids' show starts uh, at 3.30 as well to 4.30. So make sure that you do tune in and make sure that you do jot those times down. Our sun rise safari is still the same, 6 to 9 a.m. I think that's half an hour earlier this afternoon. It's going to be a, yeah, it's going to be a tough one with the sun, with it being so hot. Yeah, it's going to be tough. It's going to be tough. 
Oh, that's right. As I say, tough times never last. Only tough people last. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Kaylee, the reason for changing the show times is due to the sun. So, you know, uh, you must see, remember winter time, our sun goes down much earlier. So if we keep our, uh, our summer times, well, our summer times to the, uh, in winter, then we're not going to get much day, daylight in our sunrise and sunset safari. It's going to be more like half-half, uh, where we want to try and make it more, at least about, I say, seven-eighths of our sunset safari we want to be in daylight without the infrared only about one eighth we want to use infrared and and of course that's why we have to shift our times a little bit earlier in uh, coming into the winter uh, season and the same as the morning you'll find the morning as well so our sun will start coming up much later in winter so we will try and maybe even shift the times in our sunrise safari a little bit later so it goes when, as we go out we get the sun rising so it's all due to the shift in the seasons and it's all to the sun you know the light the light that we've got okay, this is where we heard the hyenas going crazy this morning this side, hyenas are going crazy. This side, this is Juma, this is Biffle's hook. And I'm gonna go slowly along here. Our march to freedom is irreversible. Okay, so we're going to just carry on up the road here. 
another little nest in a tree that we can show you that you've probably all seen before, maybe not. The one thing with buffalo being on the property is it brings the flies. Lots of, lots of flies. I don't mind flies too much, but when they land on your face, it's not a fan. As youngsters these days would say, it's not a vibe. Dennis, they're from last night. They're still very fresh or wet inside. There's lots of porcupine tracks here. Still wet and green inside, so having warmed up in this early morning sunshine. And Paul, you tell me where's the best angle. Will that do? Okay, so in this tall torchwood tree over here in the second fork comes another platform nest. And this, I believe, I didn't see it, was that of the African Harrier Hawk. takes about 30 days to build their nest. They could quite often build two at the same time, different sites, platform, the shallow depression, and inside the center is thickly lined with green leaves. Normally in the primary fork or upper branches of the canopy, also on cliffs or in a cave, Same nest may be used again. Laying dates August to November. Pat, that's a good question. Um, I suppose it's just the evolution of it. You know, you can probably say that many of our ground nesting birds are probably a little bit more primitive. I'm not sure. Um, different foot structure. Um, different uh, sized eggs. You know, when you move around on the ground, if you are a ground dwelling bird, um, you, you're able to carry an egg longer. And if you're able to carry an egg longer, that means that egg requires less incubation time and uh, can be developed quicker, and then those chicks follow you around. So, like a chicken. Ostrich uh, incubation time, the egg is quite big. Now, birds who are much smaller and fly around and have to be very busy uh, and active searching for food. Alrighty then, so I'm here on Gallego Pan Road and just pretty much north of our camp. I'm just going to take, there's a little secret little two track that goes along this drainage line here. I want to look along this two track just to see if we're going to get any, any luck to that side because that is when we last, last heard the hyenas calling was in this drainage line here. So let's go and see what, what's been happening around here. See what's been happening. Ooh. This morning it was going to be more like a thing of whose nest is the best? <laughs> Who made the best nest? <laughs> Who made the best nest? I think the, that uh, Helmet of Trikes nests are quite nice, they're very nice, I think they look very neat, very neat, but then the weavers nests as well, I can't, oh, see the weavers are 
I think the weavers are specialists at building nests. That's the thing. Hmm. So maybe, maybe we'll have to lean towards the weavers. All right. So this is like the little. You also like the shrike nest. Ah, yeah. I agree with you. Maybe the shrike nest is the best. I agree. Maybe uh, Jared. I think it is. I've seen it, uh, seen a shrike nest there before, so that is very nice, 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 nice. Very neat with those kind of spider webs. It just looks very interesting. This is a very interesting build, almost like the Paradise Flycatcher. I think the Paradise Flycatcher's got the most cutest little nest as well, and they use like little like pieces of wood and uh, grass and webbing. So the Paradise Flycatcher's got us got a beautiful, beautiful nest. Actually, one of the cutest little nests around. Them and the chin spot batters. Mm. Alright, so as I said, I'm on this little sneaky two track here. Just checking. You never know. You never know. Maybe we pick up on something here. Come on. A lot of Tamboti trees here. This is the drainage line. It's pretty much running all the way up from Gari Dam. I'm coming north now. Mm -mm. So far, nothing. Doesn't look like too much is up here. Looks nothing. Like Let's go up here. Ooh, you're right there. All right, let's go up the side. What? What's your? What's? Well, what's my head? <laughs> what's your? What's my head? All right. So this is as far as this little sneaky two-track goes. So females, they see the females territory is much smaller Lorraine, so you will find more females than males in the area, way more, well not way more, oh there's elephants, hello, we've got elephants here at least, look at that, that's nice, coming to join us, ooh, come, on, come this way, oh, stay there, um, so yeah, that's, you must think of female leopards, you'll have Tlalamba, you've got Shadulu, you've got Langa, you've got Kara, We've got four females really coming into into Juma. Looking at males, we only got uh, territorial males. We've got uh, TP uh, tortoise pan, and we've got uh, Mawati. So four, two males, four females. There it is. Typical. It's going to be pretty much a two to one. All right, let's go a little bit further here. Find them. Let's see if we can get a little bit further in here. Just watching the aerial. Do you think I can get it through here? Maybe, yeah. Let's try. And, sorry, we're just gonna quickly, just gonna take a look there. There we go. Wonderful, there's a whole lot of elephants this side. Okay, let's go and see if we can say hello to them here. Nice and open. female elephant just uh, eating with a little youngster behind her. We can't really see the young one, but it's stuck behind that combretum. We might see it come out now. Good morning, girl. Yes. Oh, there's a little young one. All enjoying this beautiful long lush grass. This morning, it looks like they are all very relaxed. So it just follows mom. Wherever she goes, that young one's going. 
Mm. I know Lee, it is changing quite a bit now. I, mean, I think it should be still a little bit greener than this. It's getting this typical winter colors very early on, like the browns and the khaki colors. Um, so usually about now, beginning of March, will still be much more lush, and, you know, and I think it's uh, due to the lack of uh, our summer rains this year. Um, I don't think I've looked at the weather forecast. It doesn't look like there's much more rain going to come through in March. So uh, maybe one more th storm. I think maybe one more thunderstorm would be a good a good thing for this area, just to have that little bit of a, a water inject uh, injection to to the vegetation. Um, but if nothing in March, then you know you'll see March, April, and it starts really slowing down. If, we won't really get much. Well, last year we got quite a bit in the winter, but that was last year. This year this, it seems like it's already a dry, a dry year. And we're thankful for that the rain from last year because if it wasn't for that big rain in winter, that I mean we don't get winter rain. Oh, oh, don't be, why are you bullying that little wine? That's not nice. So we don't get to your winter rain, and last year we got the winter rain, and I think that's why this bush is still looking so good, and still so thick. But it will also start deteriorating very quickly. I tell you, your dams are going to be so busy. If we don't get any more rain now, your winter time, these dams are going to be busy, busy, busy. Jonathan, yeah, nice to get some earlies this morning. Yep, we missed them. Came on this little sneaky two track, and I guess it uh, it paid off. find elephants as well start to they'll start moving more to these little drainage lines of course the drainage lines are still holding water more than uh, more so than of course the high-rised areas so all the water flows if it's underground water it'll just all flow pretty much to the low lying areas to the drainage lines and to the rivers and we'll see them feeding more along those those places that's why like the Molawati drainage will be quite it's going to be quite busy over the next few months.
see on many of the islands where we've got uh, birds that have occurred, had occurred for a long time before there was any form of mammal, um, rats and cats got introduced to most islands around the world because they were obviously stowaways on boats. The rats were anyway, and the cats were brought to control the rats on the boats. And that has decimated bird populations on the islands around the world because, well, first of all, those birds have never seen a predator before, and second of all, they probably just nested on the ground. The dodo is a classic example of a bird that was extinct in a very short period of time due to predators such as rats and cats. And I'm sure they had habitat and the ability to nest, but over a period of time, nest building became more elaborate uh, the species speciated as habitat started to change and food resources increased, different types and the niche availability of food resources increased and then very selective females led to the creation of the more developed and elaborate nests that we see today. We've got some giraffe here. It seems to be a, a little family. There was a male, a female, and a little baby. Not so little, little baby. What are you looking at? See something on the floor. Worth investigating. Pick it up, why don't you? Show the people how you bend down to pick things up. Oh, come on, don't look at me like that. No, nope, not going to do it? No, nope, I don't think so. Uh, when giraffes bend down, normally when they drink water, oh, they, it, maybe, maybe it's going to happen. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Got a fright. It was a, it was a hardy dog. That, mm, it kind of flew from one part of the tree to the other and that gave that poor baby the fright of his life. He took off. Good to know that you've got acceleration like that. <laughs> oh, it's hilarious. I was steering the hardy dog down. Not happy about that one. There, that little baby goes. Tracy, they do look like they glide. It's almost like they are running in slow motion. That's the best way I can describe it. It does look like slow motion. See how that male towels over that baby. He's a big boy. Sure. But that head, that head is huge. Capable of delivering power. Muscle busting power. Mishimu, it has been an unbelievable morning. It's been scorching hot and the top of the chair is very warm, not to touch that. But it's been an unbelievable morning filled with all sorts of lovelies. Quiet from our side, but still, I mean, we've had an enjoyable drive. We've seen lots of, uh, lots of the, the animals that don't often get seen. Spent a decent amount of time chasing around some uh, uh, mountain zebra. It just didn't want to sit still. And all in all, I think it's been a successful morning. I've seen some elephants. I've now seen a giraffe. And just how quickly they can move <laughs> when they need to. 
had an amazing, an amazing sunrise this morning. I think definitely a sunrise, one of the best that I've seen on a Makala. Definitely one of the top five. Wow, we are coming to the end of our sunrise safari. We will be seeing you this afternoon. And please remember, it's new times this afternoon. 3 o'clock for on safari. Half past 3 for the start of our sunset safari. We look forward to seeing you there. Thank you very much for tuning in. And we do hope that you tune in with us this afternoon. While we look for more animals in the heat hopefully the wind behaves itself today we'll touch wood and nose cross our fingers cross our toes our nostrils and our eyes in the hopes that a good drive is in order this afternoon